So before we start, um, I have a statement that I am obligated to state to the court. Um, I would like to begin by reading out a statement. So this hearing is in the matter of case number CFI 080-2018 before Justice Roger Giles and is being held by way of video conference. Any orders or directions made after or during the course of this hearing will be issued by the registry um, in Dubai on the judge's instructions. Uh, the claimant is represented by Armel Advocates and Legal Consultants. Lead counsel is, is Amar Bajamal. The defendant is represented by Afridi and Angel. Lead counsel is uh, Sulakshana Sina, Sina Nayaki. I apologize. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Well, gentlemen, uh, I've read the uh, skeleton arguments, of course, and the witness statements. That's two of Mr. Hugo and uh, one of. Uh, not too sure of the right pronunciation here, Miss Oga or Omar? Omar, yes. Is it Mr. Omar? My apologies to her. Um, so this is the an occasion for the oral hearing, of course. So uh, please know that I've made a petition. Thank you all that's what I've read. And now it's the occasion to emphasize. Uh, I'm sure I understand that many viewpoints respond to um, uh, apologies, Your Honor. I'm, I'm having a bit of a difficulty uh, hearing you. Same, same here, Your Honor. Right. Um, don't, don't know whether that might. Is that any better? Just if I bring it a little closer? Yes. All right. It's better, Your Honor. Excellent. Then uh, I, I, I'll, I'll repeat what I said, just so we are all on the same wavelength. Uh, I have read the skeleton arguments and I've read the witness statements of uh, uh, Mr. Hugo and Ms. Omar, and uh, they can be all taken as read. So as the occasion of oral submissions, I was uh, invited not to repeat things. This is the occasion for emphasis uh, making plain your case, responding to the, what the other side has said in their written submissions and so on. Um, as the claimant, I think it's the to be the one that begins. I assume that's what you're both. Apologies, Your Honor. Again, I, I believe you're breaking up. Um, not sure if it's just me. All right. The, the same is happening. Okay. I'll see if I have a, I will see if I have a, volume control no no um, good morning Jed. this is Ijaz from IT yeah uh, yeah uh, Usually it is fine, but while talking it goes down and it cuts off and then suddenly it comes back. Would you mind to log off and log back to the and check? I'll do that. Yes, I, I cannot see a volume control anywhere. No, there is no volume control. This is a I, microphone. So you just close the uh, disconnect and connect back. All right. I'll see you gentlemen in, in again in a couple of minutes. Uh, gentlemen, can we mute our microphone unless we are not speaking because there is a lot of noise coming if you are moving papers and moving things.
Uh, Judge, can you hear me now? Yeah, I can hear you well. Your volume has been fine. How is that? Am I coming through better? I can hear you properly. Let's see if both parties can hear you. Yes, oh, I, I can. All good here, you. All right. Well, that seems to have solved it. Uh, thank you very much. Let me know if it goes off again, and uh, I'm sure that the court will see what they can do. Um, I'll repeat it all over again. <laughs> I've read the skeleton arguments. I've read the witness statements. Um, please don't repeat things that are there just for the sake of repetition. As the oral occasion for oral submissions, it's one emphasis of uh, new matters if perhaps uh, responding to the other side and, and so on. Um, as the claimant, I think Mr. Bajmal should commence, and I assume that you have both the proceedings basis. Uh, Your Honor, we, the defendant is the applicant uh, in this particular application. I wonder if the applicant should commence. Well, the claimant is the one who ultimately has to establish jurisdiction. Very good. But I'm, I'm happy to take a different course if you are both. Uh, I know, Your Honor, I'm, 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 I agree with you, Your Honor. In fact, uh, that was a submission that I would have made. Uh, it's, it's a bit difficult for us to prove a negative, so my learned friend could perhaps start uh, and we could, uh, I could respond. Yeah, well, it, it's, it's plain common sense. Uh, Mr. Bajamal has said where he says his jurisdiction comes from. He can uh, explain and elaborate, and you can then cut him down. So, I'm, thank I'm, you. I'm happy to do that, Your Honor. Yes. Away you go then. Thank you. Um, so, um, uh, Your Honor, this 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 morning I would like to um, start by the, the the way that I have planned my submissions to the court is that I will um, address each of the um, the grounds that are raised by uh, the applicant in their application to challenge the jurisdiction of the court. So I will be taking the court through uh, my responses or the, claim, or the claimant's responses to uh, each one of these grounds. Um, before I start, I would like to uh, just um, set up a few names uh, that we are going to be referring to uh, during the, the day. So um, I would like to just clarify that when we're, which, which company is which when we're referring to the acronyms. So um, there are three entities that are relevant um, in, in these proceedings. And uh, the first one is Abraj Investment Management Limited, um, which is uh, referred to as AIML. And this is a, an island uh, incorporated company. Um, we then have Abraj Holdings Limited, uh, which is also a Cayman Islands uh, company. And then we have Abraj Capital DIFC Limited, which is a DIFC incorporated uh, company. Um, when when we, uh, a lot of the, the documents in these proceedings um, refer to the Abraj group. So it is our submission that um, when um, letterheads or uh, references are made uh, at large to the Abraj group by the company at the time, it is a reference to these three entities um, combined. Um, the, the, uh, our uh, main grounds for establishing uh, jurisdiction uh, for the DIFC courts uh, lies under gateway um, uh, uh, Article 5C of the Judicial Authority Law, which concerns an incident or transaction that, that partially or wholly uh, took place within the DIFC. And in that, we uh, rely on two um, main uh, aspects. The first is that um, the, the solicitation, the investment that was made by the claimant into AIML and the Abraj uh, group was uh, made by uh, Mr. Nakvi and other employees of the, of the, of the, of the company from uh, the DIFC. And the second ground is that the later alleged misappropriation 
of these funds also took place from the DIFC. And uh, before I start, uh, of course, I, 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 I have to state that um, in this application, or while defending this application, uh, the claimant is not required to um, establish the, the merits of any of the allegations that are made. The exercise that, 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 uh, that the court will undertake in this application is to assess whether there are enough grounds to invoke the jurisdiction of the DIFC courts on the basis of the allegations that are made and the claims that are made and whether there is a real nexus with the DIFC based on the claims rather than assess the, the merits of, of the claim. And, and, and um, in this, uh, we rely on the authority of um, uh, al Qurafi and uh, Bank um, uh, Saracen um, and, and the other authorities, which I will be referring to as well later on in my submissions. So I would like to start now with um, taking the, 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 the grounds that are mentioned in the applicant's jurisdictional challenge. Uh, the first ground is stated as that there is no evidence that Mr. Nakvi misappropriated the funds. Firstly, our position is that this ground is completely irrelevant to the question of jurisdiction. This is um, a defense on the merits uh, that will be assessed at trial. However, in any event, we say that there is, in fact, evidence that uh, there was a misappropriation. Um, I would like, in this regard, to refer the court to um, page uh, D417 of the bundle. Just wait a moment, if you don't mind. It happened to have uh, undownloaded itself. Yes, uh, D yes. 417. Um, yes, okay. 417. So uh, perhaps I just highlight, Your Honor, that this document is the um, DFSA um, uh, decision um, against uh, AIML. So it, it starts at D413, and it's the decision of the, of the DFSA. So, so um, in, in paragraph 22, Your Honor, um, the DFSA describes the reasons why did the Abraj group um, collapse. And at paragraph uh, 22b, the DFSA states that Abraj's, so one of the reasons is Abraj group's working capital, this included payroll, bonuses and transfers, and loans to individual AIML employees and entities connected with them in amounts totaling hundreds of millions of dollars. So we say that uh, this is um, evidence that the, there were misappropriations um, that occurred at the approach group at large, including the, the, the DFSA, uh, the, 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 the entities that operated from the DIFC. Um, also, um, so, so this is an issue that will uh, certainly be um, 
uh, an issue for uh, discovery at a trial with the possibility of also um, uh, joining uh, the, the liquidators of uh, the, 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 these entities to provide further evidence um, uh, during the, the trial. So, um, um, in any event, we say that this this defense that uh, whether Mr. Nakvi uh, was involved or not, although he was a member of the the, the investment committee, and we, we uh, I don't believe that this is uh, something that was contested by Mr. Nakvi. However, the 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 these allegations um, will be assessed at trial. The second ground um, on which Mr. Nakvi uh, relies is um, the fact that uh, an argument that there is no evidence that he encouraged the investment from the DIFC. And on this, um, there is a central um, um, uh, document, which is uh, the, the letter that was um, sent uh, by Mr. Nakbi to um, uh, the claimant to request that uh, that um, the funds are transferred to the bank account of AIML. That's um, the, one, the one that says following our conversations or our recent... Correct, cor correct, Your Honor, yes. So, so uh, the, the, this letter is a letter that... So, the, the, Mr. Nagby argues that he signed this letter as... Um, the chief, uh, perhaps I should open the, 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 the letter um, so I can be precise. Uh, the letter is, is available at page 230, um, Your Honor. Uh, not two thirty of my bundle, uh, Mr. Um, it, it's um, it's perhaps. Oh, sorry. Uh, apologies. It's 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 D two four two, and yeah, but there are different numberings on page. Yes, I have it. Yes. Um, so uh, this letter um, uh, has a few features which we need to consider. Uh, the first element is that the letterhead that is used at the top, it says the, Abra the Abraj group. So uh, we say that you know any reference to the Abraj group is a reference to the three companies that are referred to and one of them is a DIFC entity. Secondly, the letter um, requests the claimant to transfer the funds into the AIML bank account. And under the DFSA uh, decision, both the Cayman Island entities and specifically also AIML were found to have been operated from uh, operating from the DIFC illegally for many years. 
the DFSA decision also tells us that the employees of um, all these entities identified themselves as employees of Abraj simply there they made no distinction um, between the the entities and that they're all they all operated from the offices of Abraj and the DIC all the employees who were acting for AIML were in fact employees of uh, Abraj Capital TIFC uh, Limited. They held their employment contracts and residence visas there. So um, uh, the investigation that was led by the DFSA reveals um, that the group operated as one. Um, it also reveals expressly that this group used the reputation and the standing of the DIFC in order to encourage investors and international institutions to deal with them because the DIFC had uh, uh, reached certain um, uh, reputation worldwide for being a highly regulated um, uh, free zone and a place where uh, large institutions operate. So um, one of the conclusions that were made or the factual um, uh, 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 findings that were made by the DFSA that refer to uh, the Abraj group using this, this reputation and standing in order to attract investments and present itself as a reputable company. Now, the, 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 the argument that is made by um, Mr. Nakvi about this letter is that this letter at the bottom left hand side has the address of Abraj Holdings in the Cayman Islands. Now to that, we say that this is exactly what uh, Mr. Nakbi uh, intended, which is to create a confusion when, because he knew that, uh, but there was a lot of um, um, uh, inappropriate uh, uh, acts taking place by himself. Therefore, this letter is a, a testament to how did this group operate in the sense that you use a letterhead that says a branch group again to to a normal layman uh, investor this you know no none of these legal entities were disclosed in documents uh, there was no proper um, information given to uh, the claimant as an investor and then he used another entity to collect the funds and then a third entity to uh, as an address. So if anything, we say that this letter is an indication of the fact that this uh, gentleman operated in a manner that enabled him to establish um, superficial legal arguments later on in order to um, run away from liability for his actions. Um, Mr. Nakvi also argues that um, he signed this letter um, as vice chairman of Abraj Holdings. Uh, we say that this is incorrect because the signature states vice chairman and group chief executive. Again, group here means including the DIFC entity. Um, the, the, uh, the next point uh, that um, Mr. Nakvi um, uh, states is that, so on, on the basis of uh, this reliance on the address and the, the title under his signature, he states that the transaction therefore must have taken place And on this point, I would like to highlight to the court that both entities, AIML and Abraj Holdings Limited, are companies that are known in the Cayman Islands as 
exempt entities, which... Can I just stop you for a moment? Uh, yes. If for, for present purposes, are we concerned with uh, the location of the company involved, or are we concerned with where Mr. Nackby might have been at the time of the letter or some other relevant events? That is um, his physical location in the DIFC. Um, I, I, I don't think that we are speaking about the, that there are arguments concerning the, um, the location at where he signed this particular letter. Um, I, I, I don't believe that this argument was made by, by Mr. Nakvi in his application. Uh, the, 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 the arguments, as I understand them, relate to uh, which entities were used um, um, to um, solicit the investment and where those companies um, operated. So, and Hang on, can we just go back for a moment? Uh, what we need to do at some point is to identify a transaction or incident, don't we? Correct. And then that has to be a transaction or incident which is wholly or partly performed in the DIFC uh, and also whatever the tail end is to do with DIFC activities. And it has to be a transaction of incident out of which the claim arises or to which the claim relates. So starting point seems to be to identify the transaction or incident. You've said, I think, that uh, the one, one of the transactions you rely on is the solicitation of the investment. Correct. Now, if that is the transaction or the incident, whichever, whichever you care to call it, then do we ask where is that transic transaction or incident performed? Uh, the, I would say, uh, Your Honour, there are two um, elements to, to this incident. There is the, the act of the solicitation itself and what tools were used when to um, uh, conduct this act. And then there is the performance by the other side of, uh, in response to the decision, the, also another incident, which is the payment uh, of the funds. Right. Well, the payment of payment of the funds didn't occur in the DIFC in the sense that the money came from outside the DIFC from the claimant, uh, and it went to the Bank of Scotland. And the argument before that the Bank of Scotland, that is the Bank of Scotland, did DIFC seems to have been abandoned. So, so at the moment I'm puzzled as to that. That's why I was thinking. I had in my mind your assertion of a the transaction in the sense of solicitation. Um, yes, Your Honor, I understand your question. The, 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 my answer is the act of solicitation, the, the payment, it is not, uh, although it would have been relevant if we had um, evidence as to where, where was the physical location of the bank account. Unfortunately, we, we, we don't. And, and, and in that, I don't say that we have uh, w we are not able to uh, say that it did or it didn't just to, to just for the record so we, we are not saying that we we don't accept that it didn't but at this point we we are we also do not have evidence exactly where that so this is where we are the, the but the most important element in in, in our submission is that the control the location of the bank account is not the only element that indicates where the transaction took place because the transaction happens between two parties and the the party who is in control of the bank account wherever it is and the party who then uh, dispersed the funds is a party who operated in the DIFC as confirmed by the uh, DFSA decision so this is our uh, our contention is that uh, the, 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 the management and control and the heart and soul of 
AIML, the company that received the funds on the basis of instructions from Mr. Nakfi himself, they were all based in the DIFC. I, I follow. So, so that is in fact a, a variant or a, perhaps a more sophisticated way of putting what I put to you. I put, was putting to you where Mr. Nakfi himself was physically located. Now, am I correct that you say, well, we don't really need to worry about that. The question is where he, as the controller of the entities, uh, sorry, where the entities which he controlled in the, this transaction were based. Is that the essence of it? Cor cor correct. I mean, when, when, uh, perhaps I, I didn't explain myself uh, very clearly. When, when I said that the physical location uh, uh, is, is, is irrelevant, I, I meant the physical location where he signed this particular letter. Yeah. But, but, I, yeah, yeah. Yeah, no, I, I follow that. But while, while we're on this question, um, let's keep thinking of the asserted transaction as being solicitation. Now, we need also to see that the claim or action arises out of that or is related to it. Now, how do you put that connection? Okay, um, Your Honour, the... Let me make a little more clear. What I'm really trying to get in mind is what cause of action do you really say uh, is involved, uh, has this solicitation as one of its elements? Um, Your Honour, the, 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 the allegation or the claim relates to the fact that now there is an overwhelming um, uh, uh, mass of evidence that is available um, in the um, DFSA decision and also in public sources um, that Mr. Nakvi treated uh, the funds of uh, all these companies as his personal funds. He did not um, differentiate between his personal expenses and company expenses. and. Uh, there is um, a, a lot of um, um, uh, emails. There are a lot of emails that were um, um, uh, uh, published uh, by highly reputable um, organizations, journalist organizations, where these leaked emails indicate that, and we, we've cited um, some of them, where Mr. Nakvi gives instructions to his accounts manager to transfer company funds to his son, to transfer company funds to his uh, personal associates, and also pay for different um, um, personal expenses of his at times when the company was suffering and where the accountant is clearly telling him on email that we won't be able to meet salaries this month. The, the, Mr. Nakfi had the opportunity to respond to these emails by way of a witness statement to this court to deny that these emails were true or, or, or uh, he, he could have denied. And, and during the application to set aside the default judgment, uh, uh, he made a witness statement. He was available and he was able to make a witness statement to this court. So we say that the court should draw a negative inference from the fact that he's refusing to uh, provide evidence uh, and that these emails together with the, the, all the publicly available information, including the fact that Mr. Nakvi is uh, being prosecuted in the United States for exactly uh, misappropriating investors' um, uh, funds, and also the authority, the regulator of the DIFC, the DFSA, have confirmed the same to have taken place based on their investigations. Therefore, uh, the claimant believes that the solicitation, the act of uh, solicitation itself was an act that was done with full knowledge that these funds were never going to be invested in anything because there is no, uh, at the moment, at the time, it was, it was said that this will be used to invest uh, the funds in, 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 in the Kareem um, uh, application uh, privacy. And usually, um, when you have 
um, uh, 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 investor funds placed into uh, deployed as an investment. This is done as part of a fund structure, as we again the DFSA uh, decision uh, explains that um, this, these entities would act had would would act at uh, wearing two hats. One hat was was that they would act as investors themselves in some of the funds, and they would um, also act as a management entity for the funds. So the right and correct place for the claimant's money would have been placed in a fund that then participated in uh, an investment. Now, that investment may have been successful or not. This is a separate question. However, the fact that we have realized after um, receiving um, uh, written responses from the liquidators of the company is that there is no uh, trace of these funds. There is no client account in the name of the claimant. There are no units allocated or, or, or purchased in any of the funds that were managed or by by the companies or the garage group. So um, this, all of this, uh, uh, is the basis of the claim that from day one, Mr. Nakbi never intended to. Um, uh, 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 deploy this in this the, this money in its normal course. He was. Well, well, actually, well, well, hang on now. Now we've got to that point. How do you put that in legal terms? What is your cause of action? Is it is it fraud? Are you saying that he fraudulently invited payment of money as an investment? well knowing and intending that the money would never be invested but would be siphoned off and put into his own pocket and he is liable for the tort of fraud. For example, I, I just like to understand how you put it. Uh, uh, yes, Your Honor. Look, uh, at this point of time, it is, uh, it is possible that um, uh, that was his intention from, from the beginning. Uh, I, I don't have evidence to suggest that what was his state of mind at that uh, point of time. However, what is what what we um, argue is that either that yes, the transaction was fulfilled on part of Mr. Nakbi from the solicitation um, stage, or that later on, further to receiving the investment, he decided to use these funds possibly for his uh, personal expenses or for to pay for uh, his family expenses or um, any other unrelated company expenses, and therefore he committed this um, um, fraudulent act later on. Well, well if, if that be the situation, then what does the solicitation have to do it? How is solicitation part of the transaction out of which the claim arises? Because on one view, in that event, the claim arises simply from the fact that at a later point in time, he took money himself. One doesn't even worry. Yes, Your Honor. Yes, well, it, I, 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 I would like to rely on two, on two points. Uh, firstly, um, we, are, we are not saying that the solicitation did not involve um, bad faith from uh, uh, day one, because there are indications that it may well have uh, involved uh, bad faith. Because in the um, uh, the 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 uh, the, uh, the complaint that was made by the SEC in New York against uh, Mr. Nakbi, which is part of the bundle, I can re refer your honour to to the number uh, uh, later on. Um, in that uh, decision, there are passages, uh, or in the complaint, um, there are passages that refer to time periods where the company was uh, in dire need of cash, uh, and Mr. Nakvi um, then started uh, soliciting uh, funds from different investors, including the claimant. So the, the, the time um, period 
coincides with the same time when the second payment was requested from um, the, the claimant. Um, so on this basis, we say that it is... Uh, uh, can you hear me, Rona? I can hear you, yes. Yes. Yeah, yeah it's just because your, your video is, is frozen. Um, no, I was, I was um, very... Okay. Uh, yeah, I, I, I also I have to say, Mr. Sanaki's video is also for them on my screen, but I, I can carry on if, if that's okay. Yeah, let's just make sure, Mr. Sanaki. Uh, uh, I'm here, Your Honor. I can hear. Uh, Thank you. Okay, back to you, Mr. Batman. Okay. Um, yes. So, so that, that, so on this basis, we say that it is. Uh, it is quite possible that um, uh, the the solicitation was made in in bad faith from day one. Well, do, do, well, let As a standalone, can't hang on. Let us stop there. Unfortunately, we don't have any particulars of claim, which would have made it a lot easier because we that would let us know what the transaction was out of which your claim arises or to which it relates. Correct, Your Honour, but the, the, uh, this is I not... Do, I do need to know, I need you to tell me after careful thought, because we all know that alleging fraud is something you only do very carefully, uh, whether or not that is part of your claim. Um, Your Honour, the the facts. Uh, uh, firstly, the the lack of the particulars of claim is is due to the fact of uh, the, of how these proceedings um, uh, went on because the the, the uh, Mr. Nagbi never appeared in the, the first stage and then um, we went for a default uh, judgment application and so on. So um, uh, so and we never got. Stop you preparing, but you haven't. So let's move on. Yeah. Um, the the the. To answer your question, Your Honor, the, the, the claim as it stands is that we argue that Mr. Nakvi is personally responsible for the acts of um, losing or the, these funds literally disappearing from um, the company and the fact that, uh, and this personal responsibility can derive from uh, a number of uh, legal grounds, including the possibility of uh, fraud. But the claim is based on the fact that he solicited the investment personally, and then he um, did not deploy the funds to their rightful place. On this basis, and, and this was mentioned in, in, in our uh, submissions uh, to, to the court in our, in our claim form, that we argue that this establishes um, a, a constructive trust um, in favor of uh, the claimant uh, on the basis that uh, Mr. Nakvi personally uh, was personally responsible as uh, based on his fiduciary because the company received uh, these funds under a fiduciary duty because it's, it's, it's said in this letter that it will be invested under a discretionary investment scheme. Therefore, Mr. Nakvi owed the claimant um, a fiduciary duty to um, deal with the claimant's funds in, um, in the way that they were supposed to be dealt with. And what we claim is that he has failed to satisfy this fiduciary duty, and therefore he should be held personally liable for uh, these acts. Well, um, that gets into the merits and... Uh, um not to ensure that I embrace that he uh, that he personally had a fiduciary duty. Does, uh, I'm does, sorry, I didn't hear that, Your Honour. Not at all. Uh, I said I'm. This does get into the merits, and I'm not too sure that I would embrace that he owed a fiduciary duty. But that does give point to my question: How does the solicitation come into play? Uh, is it an element of the claim? 
it is it is the basis on 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 which the the, the funds were were paid. So they they had the funds not been had the solicitation not been made, the funds would not have been invested, and anything that had occurred um, thereafter in terms of misappropriation would not have occurred. Right. Okay. All right. Now, well, I think you, you were going through the uh, matters on which the defendant provided uh, and responding to them. So we best get back to that. I took you off that course. Thank you, Your Honor. Um, the the um, I, I I had reached to the the, the third um, um, second ground, but the second ground had. Um, a few limbs that I've that, 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 that dealt with and that, that where I reached was that I, I was uh, um, expressing the, 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 the uh, I've already addressed the point about the, the witness statement so I'll move on to the third ground which is um, uh, Mr. Nakvi argues that uh, there is no evidence that he misappropriated the funds personally um, again we we say that um, this is a question for the uh, the substantive uh, stage of the of the of the proceedings. However, there is um, um, a connection um, to be made from the relevant uh, paragraphs of the DFSA decision and also the um, the leaked emails, which uh, Mr. Nakwi did not uh, deny. Um, the the uh, how uh, so th th these were the three grounds that Mr. Nakbi relied on to challenge the jurisdiction of the court. However, what I would like to finally say on on the, on on this point is that Mr. Nakbi is the applicant um, in this application, and he does not provide the court with any explanation as to if these entities or these transactions took place um, outside the DIFC, then where was that uh, location? Because um, it is in the evidence that Cayman Island companies, exempted companies, are by law companies that are not permitted to uh, carry out any business activity in the Cayman Islands itself. Uh, we also know from the DFSA decision that the DFSA concluded that the, the addresses uh, in the Cayman Islands, like many Cayman Islands entities, are basically for the purposes of paperwork. Now, so legally, these two entities could have only carried out business outside the Cayman Islands. And the DFSA concluded based on a thorough investigation that they were operating within the DIFC. Now, there is no alternative um, factual scenario offered by Mr. Nakvi as to if they weren't in the DIFC, then where were they? So on this basis, um, um, uh, we would argue that uh, the evidence um, in the form of a DFSA conclusion, the DFSA decision uh, is uncontested by, by Mr. Nakwi. Um, now I would like to uh, move to the second thing because uh, I, as, as, as Your Honor um, rightfully um, highlighted, there are two limbs to, to uh, our uh, jurisdictional arguments. Well, first is the solicitation and the second is the misappropriation, which we say is a standalone uh, ground that, that the court should assess uh, as such. Um, uh, the, 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 the misappropriation of the funds is that if it re relates to the question of where AIML and the Abraj group operated from. Because the management and control of um, uh, this, this entity determines who um, committed this misappropriation and will determine who might or might not be personally liable for it. And 
on under this heading, we say that the DFSA uh, decision, which is uncontested by Mr. Nakvi, um, highlights that the all the senior uh, management uh, members of the three entities, the Abraj Group, uh, operated from uh, the the DFC. Um, I would also like to now take your honor through uh, a few paragraphs. I'm not I'm not going to take your honor to each one of them, but I'm, I will refer to certain paragraphs and what they um, conclude. Um, so in the DFSA decision, uh, we have in paragraph 24, it, it is said that AIML misled and deceived the um, limited partners in, in, in the funds into believing that their cash remained within the funds. In paragraph 31, um, uh, it is confirmed that IML was not authorized by law to carry out activities in the Cayman Islands. Um, in paragraph 36, it is confirmed that all the senior management um, of the three entities were common, including uh, Mr. Nakvi. And again, he does not deny this, this fact. He does not deny uh, the fact that he was a member of the Global Investment um, uh, Committee, um, which also the DFSA decision confirms to have been operating from the DIFC. Um, in paragraph uh, 40, the DFSA points out to an important fact, which is that there were a set of delegation agreements between AIML and Abraj Capital, uh, the DIFC entity. Under these agreements, um, uh, a number of the functions of AIML were delegated to the DIFC entity. Um, that we say that this is an indication that, again, the misappropriation uh, could also be traced to the, the IFC entity. And, and, and in, in this regard, there would be um, no need to investigate further whether IML, AIML uh, was operating at the DIFC or not, although this is not contested by, by Mr. By Mr. Nakbi. Uh, but this connection, this contractual connection between the two entities um, establishes a, a clear path for uh, jurisdiction. Um, in paragraph um, 72, um, uh, uh, the DFSA confirms that AIML and Abraj Capital were co-located or shared the same office at the DIFC. And then in paragraph 73, um, it is confirmed that the staff identified themselves as employees of all the companies together. Um, in paragraph 113 of the DFSA, it is confirmed that the Abraj Group Finance Team was based in the DIFC. Uh, and this, this has important significance in our case because uh, 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 this is where, uh, this is the place where any decisions as to the receiving or dispersing of funds would have taken place. So this is, again, a direct, um, uh, 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 it, it, it is the direct link to uh, that the fact that the misappropriation um, act, as alleged by the claimant, took place in the DIFC, and this is a standalone um, incident other than the solicitation. Um, in paragraphs 148 to 152, um, um, the DFSA um, uh, explains uh, different forms of uh, misleading acts under which the Abraj group um, provided false information to investors. So the, the, in our submission, all of these conclusions made by the DFSA, which are not um, uh, denied uh, by Mr. Nakbi, um, establish um, 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 that the, the alleged misappropriation took place within the DIFC. And um, 
Uh, yes, I've already addressed the, the issue of the, 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 the negative inference that we would like uh, the court to consider. And um, uh, just as a last uh, point, um, I would like to, to, to highlight that uh, this case also has um, a public interest um, element uh, in the sense that the, the, the actions of the Abraj group um, uh, were um, acts that are that that generally are damaging to the DIFC in general. Before you go too far, this does not seem to be to be, to be relevant. Um, okay, I I, I I understand, Your Honor. So I, I, this is uh, this is all I have to um, submit on the main two elements: the solicitation and the misappropriation elements. Um, I'm, I'm happy to answer any questions your honor might have. All right. Well, there is the last limb of uh, uh, related to DIFC, DIFC activities or exact words. You know what I'm talking about. I, I uh, I'm, sorry. I'm sorry. I'm afraid I didn't hear you. Not at all. There, there are the words at the tail that uh, about DIFC activities. I take it your submission is that uh, if you are right about everything so far, then it follows automatically that it's related to DIFC activities. Correct. It, it relates to an incident that took place in the DIFC, correct? That, that, uh, the, yeah. That's not uh, the point. Uh, um, the, let me... Paragraph C talks about a claim or action arising out or relating to any incident or transaction wholly or partly performed within DIFC and is related to DIFC activities. There are two limbs. The transaction or incident has to also be related to DIFC activities. Now, um, as I said, I take it that your submission is that if you're right about uh, everything you've said so far, then automatically it, it must be that the incident or transaction is related to DIFC activities. But if there is, if that's not right, or if there's something more you want to say about that, then please say it. Uh, it is, it, this is right, but, and, and, and because the, the, the DFSA decision itself concludes that uh, these were DIFC uh, regulated activities that were undertaking and hence uh, the, the involvement of the DFSA because the DFSA is the regulator of these DIFC activities and, and, and therefore um, uh, it, it, it imposed the, the fine and, and the other sanctions on, on the companies. Yeah. Yes, I'll, I'll follow. Thank you. Nothing else? Um, yes, thank you, Your Honour. Thank you. All right. Well, now, Mr. Senanayaka, over to you. Thank you, Your Honor. Um, before I uh, continue, um, may I just ask Your Honor if there's any particular area you'd like me to address first? Uh, no, you, you take your own course. Um, again, I urge you not to repeat things that are in your written submissions. Uh, thank, thank you very much, Your Honor. Um, let me just first start with uh, a reminder of what the claimant's claim is as borne out by um, its claim form. Um, the only indication of the claimant's claim, as far as we are aware of, and the defense, and the claimant did have opportunity to fully particularize its claim by this time, uh, given the various applications, still remains as quoted in the amended claim form, which is found at A4 of the bundle. Let me read it out. Uh, the defendant misappropriated funds from the claimant in a sum of 80, 20 million by causing the claimant to transfer the funds for the purpose of investing in a private placement in a transport company, Kareem, the defendant then failed to return the invested sums and the profit and interest incurred to the claimant. Now, um, through various witness statements and submissions, the claimant has uh, developed or given various versions of what this claim is, but as your honor correctly observed, and I believe uh, as uh, Mr. Bajamal seemed to confirm, this appears to be a claim of fraud 
uh, or deceit as the DRC law of obligations recognizes. Um, that said, uh, the, it, it's very important to note, Your Honor, and this is fundamental to the claim, that the claim is made personally against Mr. Arif Nafi, not against AIML, ACL, or the Abraj group. Um, and the claimant has to show some cause of action, uh, which ties Mr. Nafi to its claim. Uh, it must also show for the purposes of this application that there is at least a prima facie or apparent reason as to why the DFC courts should have jurisdiction. Now, the claimant admits that it's only uh, anchor jurisdiction of the DFC courts is Article 5A1C uh, of the Judicial Authority Law, which Your Honor uh, quoted quite a few, times, which I will quote for the last time. Uh, the court will have jurisdiction uh, over civil or commercial claims and actions arising out of or in relation to any incident or transaction which has been wholly or partly performed within the DFC and is related to DFC activities. Now, as Your Honor correctly observed, and as is borne out by uh, case law in the DFC, uh, Article 501 has a two tier test. One must first show that a transaction did, in fact, occur in the DFC, and then one must show that this was related to a DFC activity. Sure. I have given you all authorities, uh, most relevant of which is. Uh, the SCT case 209 of 2020 by Her Excellency Justice Maha Al Mihari, where she clearly distinguishes that there is a two tier test as contemplated in this article. Now, in my submission, and despite Mr. Bajmal's submission, it is, uh, it is clear that the claimant has failed in both of these uh, limbs of the relevant article, uh, and that this court would uh, have jurisdiction jurisdiction to hear the claim. Now, I'd like to make it also very clear at, 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 uh, in the beginning that whatever public information that is available to the claimant or the public or around the world is really relevant to the question of the claimant's particular claim against the defendant. The claimant claims that a specific sum of 20 million dirhams was misappropriated by Mr. Nakwe. There is absolutely no evidence in the public domain even, or, and, and certainly the, the claimant has not produced any direct evidence uh, of this particular amount of uh, uh, it, 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 it is important to note that the claimant's entire claim on jurisdiction appears to be based on uh, the active solicitation that occurred in the DRC. Now, while the claimant has criticized Mr. Nakwi for not filing direct evidence uh, in denying these allegations, um, it's also concerning that the act of solicitation uh, is wholly unsupported by any direct evidence by the claimant. Uh, uh, from, from what we understand, uh, it is the claimant's claim that Mr. Uh, uh, His Excellency uh, uh, Al um, well solicited, uh, met Mr. Nakwi, and Mr. Nakwi has, uh, for some reason, so convinced him to uh, invest this amount, uh, quite apart from the fact that it leaves a question as to who the correct claimant is. The point is, there is no direct evidence. My learned friend repeatedly referred to the decision notices of the DFSA. I'm sure you are aware of the role of the DFSA in the DFC. Um, it is an administrative body that starts with safeguarding the um, financial services of the DIFC. Now, in, the, in these particular decision notices, I'd like to point your honor to one very particular paragraph, and that is paragraph three uh, of the decision notice, which is found at D419. Decision. 
Apologies, Your Honor. I, I believe it's D340. D3, uh, D417. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. Yeah. <coughs> yes, Your Honor, it's uh once again, for the final time, D419. D419, hang on a minute. Mm -hmm. Uh, yeah, not not by D four one nine. Uh your honor in my bundle, which is the one that I've uploaded, um D four one nine appears to be the decision notice, but it sits in the body of the decision notice. Um I, I would be referring to paragraph three of the decision notice. Well I've I've uh, I've found paragraph three. This the notes is addressed to Diana. Line. That's what you, you're after? Precisely, Your Honor. The notice is addressed to AIML alone. Nothing in this notice constitutes a determination that any person other than AIML breach any legal or regulatory rule, and the opinions expressed in this notice are without prejudice to the position of any third party or of the DFSA in relation to any third party. Now, Your Honor, my learned friend's entire case appears to be, appears to be based on findings of the DFSA. Now, this paragraph itself clearly make, makes it very clear that the decision notice is, does not allege of any wrongdoing by any party. So as, as far as the claimant's personal claim against Mr. Nakhwe is concerned, the evidential value of the decision notice is, is, is very doubtful. Uh, at, at him. Why, now, do you say that? Why do you say that? If, if a finding of fact is made in the notice, even though it is in the course of an investigation of something to do with AIML and there's this precautionary statement, why is that not some prima facie evidence sufficient for a, an interlocutor hearing such as this? Uh, for a number of reasons, Your Honor. Firstly, um, again, I would say that the decision notice does not refer to Mr. Nakui at any point. Uh, secondly, Mr. Nakui did not have an opportunity to challenge uh, the decision notice uh, for the simple reason that it's not directed at him. Um, as Your Honor is aware, uh, AIML and ACL are under liquidation. The liquidators um, have... But then, okay, this is nonsense. A piece of evidence is a piece of evidence. It doesn't matter whether the party against whom it's used had the opportunity to challenge it. Um, it. My question why why is not a considered finding in a document such as this prima facie evidence of something for the purposes of an interlocutory application like this to the extent your honor that um, uh, that, that it concerns the claimant's claim as i would i would find it very difficult to believe that the decision notice has prima facie evidence which relates to the claimant's personal claim against Mr. Nakwi. Now, all it says, all this decision notice says, is that certain activities were carried by AIML in the DIFC, contrary to certain regulations. Now, it does not say that all activities by AIML was carried out in the DIFC. That's not what it implies. It just simply says certain activities were carried out. And, and, and the actual basis for the DFSA's fine against AI, uh, AIML, as borne out by, the, by this decision notice, is not for misappropriation, but more because they carried out activities in the DIFC, 
without the appropriate license. Now, to the extent that uh, my uh, learned friend claims that this shows misappropriation by Mr. Nakwe, even other documents would show that this this entire um, well, in my learned uh, learned friend's uh, word scheme was, was was could not have been simply run by Mr. Nakwe. Even the indictment in the United States names at least six other uh, persons, and none of these allegations have been proven in a court. So, to the extent that the decision notice appears to say that there were activities carried out in the DIC, it's my respectful position that it does not say that all activities by Mr. Nakhvi or AIML were carried out in the DIFC. And in any event, Your Honor, prima facie evidence would, in my uh, respectful submission, amount to more than a third party finding, which is not directed at the claim. Is it not up to the claimant to show by the relevant article to claim jurisdiction? That is my simple submission on that point. All right. Well, the question then is whether this is something which can, in part, satisfy that. Um, but we really haven't advanced very far. To the, Your Honour, as I, uh, the, the, the way I started my submission was that uh, uh, the claimant would have to prove two particular uh, tests in the judicial authority law uh, to to um, to successfully overcome the jurisdiction objection. One is whether the activities were carried out in the DRC, and secondly, whether there were any, uh, whether the activities related to the DRC. In my respectful submission, the decision notice does not conclusively say that AIML carried all activities in the DRC, and secondly, that that not every act. It does not say that all activities carried out by AIML were in fact related to the DIFC. It's, 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 it's simply a finding on AIML itself, which does not satisfy both tiers of the test, Your Honor. If this was the case, if uh, parties were allowed to rely on a decision notice uh, of uh, the DFSA in, in claiming personal claims, which amount to fraud, which obviously has a very high threshold, one may open quite a lot of floodgates. And a number of claims might come to the DFC courts on, on, on the basis of published decision notices, which have no relationship to the management of the, uh, to the management of the relevant entities. So, so that's 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 quite a concern, Your Honor. I would, I would respectfully submit that this is not the decision notice itself is not enough to overcome the threshold. The test for jurisdiction has to be a lot more than a third party finding, which does not even name the defendant. Okay. Now, uh, may I proceed, Your Honor? Yes, please. Now, in connection with Your Honor's question, I would also say that to the extent that the claimant is claiming that a fraud was carried out in the DIFC, there is quite a high um, burden of proof that the claimant must, must show, not on the merits itself, but to simply say that a fraud was carried out in the DIFC for the claimant to uh, uh, to get jurisdiction over the present claim. Now, the thought of fraud as recognized recognizing the DIFC law of obligation is in fact the the thought of deceit. Now, the uh, uh, apologies, your 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 honor, I'm I'm reading out from the law of obligations, uh, Article 31. Um, a defendant is liable in deceit if he makes a statement that is fraudulent. He intends that a person should rely on the fraudulent statement. The claimant relies upon the statement and the claimant suffers loss as a result of relying upon the statement. Now, I would, Your Honor, this is a, the, 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 the thought of deceit clearly has four elements and these are not separate elements, but all four elements must be satisfied. And for, to the extent that there's a cause of action in deceit, which attracts the jurisdiction of the DFC courts, the claimant must prove that all of these separate activities, so at least to, at least to, to, to a reasonable uh, degree, did occur in the DFC. And again, the decision notice itself in my submission uh, certainly does not cast aspersions of deceit on Mr. I, Nakhvi. I think authority might be against you on that one. It's enough if one element does. Let's. 
understanding of the authorities. Uh, very well, Your Honor. I'll take your point on that. But my, my point remains that at, even if one ele at least one element should therefore be established, and in my submission, none of these submissions uh, are established at, at a minimum. Uh, Mr. Nakhvi should have made a statement that is fraudulent, or Mr. Nakhvi should have intended and should rely on the fraudulent statement, or the, Mr. Nakhvi should rely, or oh, sorry, the, the claimant should rely upon the statement, uh, or the uh, the claimant should show that it, it's suffered loss. I, I would not say that uh, C and D are distinct, but at a minimum, that the loss was suffered as a result of relying on that statement. Now, the only statement or Citation which uh, which the claimant relies on is a letter which your honor was taken to, and I would not uh, waste your honor's time again. Uh, which prima facie shows that, well, firstly, it does not show where Mr. Nakhvi was based at the time the letter was issued, uh, as your honor correctly questioned, and I and I believe that question is quite relevant. Uh, secondly, it it clearly shows that uh, in its signature that it was issued from the Cayman Islands, so. Uh, one may reasonably assume, uh, subject to contrary evidence of which there is none, that it was issued from the Cayman Islands. And if it was not, uh, the claimant would have made an issue of this and said, why is this not being issued from the DIFC? That was not done. I think I can be confident of one thing, that Mr. Nackby was not in the Cayman Islands when he signed that letter. Your Honor, I, I do not have instructions on that, and, I, and, and I'm Obviously, I understand that there's there's a lot of public information in the in the public domain about Mr. Nakhvi. It's not public information, Mr. Nakhvi. It's just plain common sense. And funnily enough, judges do not leave their common sense out of the courtroom. Absolutely, <laughs> I'm grateful for that. But I mean, it is it is in fact a, a fundamental principle of law that it's for the claimant to establish its claim and not for the defendant to established claimant's claim. So uh, Mr. Nakhvi has fully denied any acts of misappropriation that is claim. He has fully denied that uh, uh, he has he has and 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 uh, for the purposes of this hearing it's my respectful submission that public information should should be um, taken um, with with caution and uh, at a minimum um, uh, Mr. Nakhvi has still not been found uh, as far as I'm instructed guilty of an offense by any competent court. Um, and, and that's, I will leave it at that because I would be going beyond the evidence before your honor, uh, in, in making those, uh, comments. Um, so to the extent that the, the claimant's only reliance, uh, or, or only reliance of any solicitation occurred from the DIFC, I would say that with, we do not know where Mr. Nakhvi at the time that letter was. In any event, whether that letter itself was a solicitation is quite doubtful. All it says was me that occurred. We do not know what the location is. Uh, and uh, here are the details for the transfer. Now, that leads to the third, uh, uh, another interesting point, which is that the funds were quite prima facie, I would say, transferred to a bank account, which, is, which cannot have been situated in the DIFC for the following reasons. Firstly, the DIFC legal framework, and we have given evidence of this in our witness statements and skeletons, financial institutions cannot accept deposits in dirhams uh, in, in the DIFC due to it, it being a free zone. Now, that is made very clear in, in the relevant legislation which I have cited. Uh, secondly, as we have also evidence, uh, the, ba the Royal Bank of Scotland has an, had a number of branches around the UAE, and it's quite likely that uh, the money did come in from uh, or did come into a separate entity, given the obvious limitations of the DFC branch. So to the extent that that evidence is not so far challenged, clearly the burden of proof has shifted in favor of Mr. Nakhvi to show that the funds may not, could not have been sent to a DFC branch of the Royal Bank of Scotland, unless contrary evidence is produced, of which there is none. Now, my uh, the, the claimant has in its, uh, in, in its reply with the statement, stated that it will make further application to establish where exactly the funds came to. Now, for it, it has not done so, so far. And right now, for the purpose of this hearing, there is no evidence to show that the transaction came to the DIFC or occurred from the DIFC. There's contrary evidence. 
And in my respectful submission, the, any attempt to claim jurisdiction on the basis that a transaction occurred in PFC is, is simply not supported by evidence. Um, thirdly, uh, another point which uh, your honor quite rightly raised and I may add to um, is, 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 is the question of how solicitation is relevant to the question of fraud. Now, I, I may have addressed this in my, in my uh, previous part of the submission, but your honor, uh, quite... I'm sorry to stop you, but I did not ask that question. Solicitation is plainly relevant to the question of fraud. I may have misunderstood your honor, but, but in, I would say that I would, I would just repeat the first part of my submission to say that there is no evidence of solicitation of the funds having occurred from the DFC. Uh, and I'll move on to the next point. Um, your, again, do correct me if I have misunderstood or misheard, Your Honor. There was a question raised as, uh, or, or an observation made by Your Honor, that there is no particular claim presently so that the, the claimant or the court. In my submission, Your Honor, firstly, the claimant could have produced a draft. Uh, particular claim in response to the jurisdictional application or even the set aside application as is uh, as, as as is being done in, in or has been done in previous cases uh, so it's not a defense to simply say that the the proceedings were of such a nature that the claimant did not have an opportunity to produce the the particulars of claim even if there was a particular claim the claimant had a had had every opportunity to present its case through witness evidence and as far as and in my submissions, I do not believe that that has been done, uh, nor do I believe or, or uh, does the defendant believe that there is any evidence a reason as to why the DFC courts should um, uh, take jurisdiction. Um, My learned friend also relied on Al Karafi and Bank Saracen, um, um, although he did not take your honor through the, uh, the the cases in detail. My only submission in relation to the two cases uh, would be that Bank Saracen, the case of Bank Saracen, as quoted in my learned friend's uh, um, skeleton argument, involved the association of jurisdiction against a branch of the uh, of the Swiss bank. Uh, Apologies. Um, the, the principal was found to be liable due to the acts of the defendant because uh, due to the acts of the agent because the agents were acting from the jurisdiction of the DIFC. Now that brings me to a further point, Your Honor, that Mr. Nakwi and every single employee can only be assumed to have acted as agents of the Abraj Group, whatever entity it is. And the general principle of law is that the acts of an agent is attributed to the principal and not the other way around, as, as, as the, uh, the claimant's claim appears to be. So it, it's very important to distinguish Bank Saracen from the facts of the present case. In, in the case of Bank Saracen, the court held that because agents of the principal were based in the DIFC, the DIFC courts would have jurisdiction over the principal, which is based out of the principal not relevant to the present case and in fact the opposite is relevant uh the agents cannot be held liable now for my learned friend to go through the agency principle uh general uh, basis of law one must show that the agent acted fraudulently or outside its authority now in my submission again there is there is no evidence that in relation to this particular transaction or in fact any transaction mr nakwi acted fraudulently. There may have been a finding against EIML that certain acts were done contrary to uh, legislation or the applicable regulations, but I, I, I would only be repeating my submission that that really is not the threshold that one must satisfy. Um, I mean, this, uh, I, I'm, I'm addressing the other aspersions made by uh, or, or referred to by by the claimant as found in a certain book called the key man now if uh, it is my it is the claimant's case that even documents or, or investigative journalism pieces which which are published uh, and are available in the public domain 
would 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 uh, give the court a prima facie reason to attract jurisdiction based on what's said on those books, I, I would I would have serious issues with that, Your Honor, for the simple reason that that would again open a number of floodgates where uh, just because uh, somebody publishes a book which which, uh, which the uh, which which a party named in that book obviously had no opportunity to comment on or did not comment on. Is finally found uh, liable in, in in a particular jurisdiction. Now, if that is the 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 relevant test or the threshold, I would say that that's that's quite a uh, serious matter for for the court to consider. Um, Your Honor, apologies. Just, I may be uh, jumping uh, uh, in my arguments. Another reason that Mr. Nakhvi did not challenge the DFSA's decision notice is, is because currently facing criminal action um, and any statement that he makes in a public forum can be used as evidence against him uh, to the extent that this is relevant um, and, and, and uh, already a DRC judgment uh, on the issue uh, which relates to Mr. Nakhvi and an action which the DFS takes to take against him. It's a judicial review claim and, and Mr. Nakhvi has presented in that it is difficult for him to make any statements in relation to administrative proceedings because uh, his rights under the American Constitution would be violated if uh, he basically has the right to stay silent, given the serious criminal um, um, allegations made against him in the US. And he does not want to question his positions. And, and that seems to be a legitimate reason, or at least uh, we believe is a legitimate reason for not producing substantial evidence, which could affect his defense in the DIA, in, in the USA. That's that's all I would say about uh, to, uh, to add the why Mr. Nakhvi has not hold it, hold it, hold it. How is that at all relevant? Again, Your Honor, it's it's just to address Your Honor's point that the DFSA's decision notice should not be taken at face value to the extent that it makes allegations against Mr. Nakhvi. Firstly, that is, do that is my point. That is your point. Your Honor, let me let me just uh, present an alternative scenario. Let's assume that uh, AIML, ACL, all the entities were based in the DIFC. But would that be sufficient for a, a defendant to, to or a claimant to raise a claim against an executive of that organization who is simply acting as an agent of that organization without making at least that the, the party. Now, there could be a claim of conspiracy, there could be a claim of uh, negligence, whatever it is. It works in the DIFC alone responsible for any acts which the claimant claims uh, he, he has committed it, uh, with, without any further evidence of fraud or any evidence as to how a cause of, uh, cause of action is established against that particular defendant. In my respectful submission, Your Honor, again, that is not sufficient. AIML, AC, to the defendant, that's, that's a matter of fact, which is in trial. But for the trial, one must demonstrate that there is a personal cause of action against him, or a combined cause of action against him and AIML. That's a matter that was proceed to trial, but, but a simple argument that he alone is responsible is 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 a is a higher threshold even in relation to jurisdiction that the, that the claimant must prove um your honor unless your honor has any i, I would not even address the issue of public interest element in in this matter uh, which my learned friend uh, commented on at no, the end. that is equally irrelevant even if there is huge public interest, if I find there is no jurisdiction, there's no jurisdiction. Or I believe the learned friend seems to have dropped off. Oh dear. Uh, I, I can still hear you. Okay. Thank you very much. Good. Your Honor, do uh, is there any other issue you would like me to address? Or um, no, thank you. That is fine. If you have said all you wish to say. Um. Yes, Your Honor. I, I would not want to repeat myself. My main submissions are in the skeleton argument, um, and I would rest there. Thank you. 
All right, well, Mr. Bedgemal, uh, what would you like to say in reply? Yes, very briefly, uh, Your, Your Honor. Um, uh, uh, the, the, uh, there was a, a reference to, uh, again, the, the, the letter um, where the funds were, were, were requested. And uh, was, what um, Mr. Sanaskaya is um, arguing is that this letter does not um, form an act of um, uh, solicitation or is not connected to an act of, of, of solicitation. However, you know, as, as we pointed out in our submissions, is this letter confirms in the beginning that it says further to our discussion. So it, it, it refers to um, uh, whether the letter itself is the form of solicitation or it confirms that an act of solicitation uh, took place uh, before that. The, the, the second point I wanted to address, Your Honor, on is uh, the reference to the DFSA's um, uh, comment in, in paragraph uh, three. And as Your Honor rightly said, is that this document is a, is a public document which uh, is based on an investigation carried out by the relevant authority. Um, the, uh, although the, the, the dispositive parts of the um, uh, the, the decision may not relate to uh, Mr. Uh, Nakbi himself. However, there are very important factual uh, findings in that um, document. And uh, uh, it, it is not the question of uh, whether Mr. Nakbi had the opportunity to challenge the decision himself or whether he had the capacity to challenge the decision. He had the opportunity to address this court about what is his evidence and what are his views about the facts that are mentioned in the decision, and he chose not to do so. Um, and and uh, again, we say that it is completely irrelevant um, as to any uh, rights that he might be, uh, you know, uh, uh, granted under U.S. law, or U.S. Constitution. Um, uh, the, the 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 next point um, uh, I wanted to um, address is. Um, the fact that it was argued that the DFSA decision does not um, uh, conclude that AIML was primarily based in the in the, in the DIFC, or uh, and, and on this point, I would like to um, refer you know to uh, paragraph 31 of uh, the decision, which I will I will read uh, quickly. It says. Um, um, AIML's registered office address is in Ogland House, South Church Street, PO Box 309, Georgetown, Grand Cayman. Um, however, as an exempted company, AIML was not permitted and did not carry on any business from its registered office in the Cayman Islands. Instead, AIML carried on its activities from Dubai and primarily operated from the Abraj Group offices in the DIFC. And I've already um, referred um, uh, to all the relevant uh, paragraphs, which uh, the court can can um, consider, uh, where uh, you know the the, the the fact that the, the finance team was based in the DIFC and and so on. So I'm not going to repeat that. Um, uh, the 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 point uh, w with regards to uh, um, the, the, the 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 published information in the book, the key man. I just uh, would like to make a clarification that. The, the, the reliance that is made by the claimant is not on um, uh, uh, the opinions of journalists. Uh, there are this book contains um, um, the work product of uh, investigative journalism, and it includes a set of leaked emails and documents. Right? So our reliance is not on the opinions expressed by journalists. Our reliance is on those documents which have become uh, available in the public domain. So the, the book was just the medium where, where these documents became um, uh, available to the public. Uh, therefore, again, uh, Mr. Nagby uh, was able to address and deny the, 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 the emails or give his scenario to this court. However, he chose not to do so, which we say is, is enough.
for the court to draw a negative inference uh, from. Um, the next point uh, I would like to address uh, is uh, the bank Saracen authority. And um, I believe that, the, that Mr. Nagvi may have uh, uh, misconstrued the, 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 uh, which part of the authority we rely on. And, and the, 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 although this authority may uh, have addressed a number of legal issues in jurisdiction, but the point that we rely on is that the court was satisfied that in situations where the employees of a DIFC entity uh, made, who also happened to be employees of a non-DIFC entity, um, made no distinction when acting in their daily uh, work or dealing with investors and so on, made no distinction as to which entity um, they are uh, working for, that was found to be enough to, uh, uh, or this was one of the points to court uh, accepting that uh, the, the jurisdiction of the DIC courts is. Um, uh, the, uh, the, um, the, the last point is um, there was a comment uh, about uh, why uh, Mr. Nagbi. Uh, there were a number of um, uh, management uh, uh, personnel in the company, so why Mr. Nakfi should be liable for this? Again, I, I believe this is a this is a question, or I submit that this is a a, a question for um, uh, trial. And uh, but to answer this question, uh, it's the fact that Mr. Nakfi was the point of contact and was the instigator of this investment with uh, the claimant and and we say that he was also uh, in terms of financial decisions within the company he was also um, uh, responsible for making those decisions uh, within um, to, to to later on how to disperse with uh, th those funds um, uh, lastly um, i would like to um, um, uh, uh, stress that we are in in in, in civil proceedings, and um, the, the 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 evidence is to uh, be uh, weighted based on the balance of uh, probabilities. And we believe that we have presented enough evidence um, to, to suggest that it was highly probable that the incidents. Uh, took the incidents uh, 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 that we referred to took place in the DIFC as opposed to the Cayman Islands or any other uh, jurisdiction. Yes, thank you. Excuse me for, excuse me for a minute. Yes, thank you. All right, I'm proposing to reserve my decision um, to try to avoid have another hearing about it. This strikes me as the kind of application where costs follow the event and there's not much, nothing that really can Apologies, Your Honour, I, I hear you. I'm, I'm sorry, did you say you can't hear me? Yes, Your Honour, you're breaking up. Okay. I'll, I'll say it again and, and uh, tell me if it's not clear. I'm going to reserve my decision in order to try to avoid another hearing about costs. I, what I am suggesting is that this seems to be a case where costs of this application should follow the event. There's really nothing to be said one way or the other. Otherwise. Is that something which you can agree to? Or Yes, Your Honor, I would say that uh, that should be the right uh, position. Yes, uh, agreed as, by the claimant as well, Your Honor. That's, that's excellent. Thank you, gentlemen. All right. Well, uh, it, it only remains then to thank you for your assistance and uh, to thank Sharla for her assistance also.
and uh, at least at my end to say good night. Thank you very much, Elena. Thank you very much, Your Honor. Thank you, gentlemen. Good night. Thank you, Your Honor. Good night. Thanks, Adam. Good night.